Turn to the book of Job, chapter 1. The book of Job, chapter number 1. In verse number 6 it says, There was a day when the sons of God, these are angels, folks, came to present themselves before the Lord, Jehovah, and Satan came also among them. The Lord said to Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Father, I ask you, Lord, to bless your word now as it goes forth. And Father, I pray that you'd anoint the messenger. And I pray, Father, that you give the folks hearts to hear, receptive hearts, receptive ears. In Jesus' name, amen. The book of Job, as I've said to you before many times, is undoubtedly the oldest book in the Bible, the Old Testament. Uh, now, the events recorded in the book of Job uh, chronologically are not the oldest events, but Job probably was the first book written. We don't know who wrote Job. There's a lot of tradition out there that says that Moses wrote it. If that be true, the book of Job talks about a time about 1900 B.C. If Moses wrote it, you're talking about a difference of 500 years. We don't know that Moses wrote it. And nobody can nail down for sure who wrote the book of Job. But the thing that's remarkable about the book of Job is that some of the things mentioned in Job come right down to us today and haven't changed one bit. I want you to notice the Bible says, and Satan, S-A-T-A-N, the Hebrew is Satan, it means an adversary. The word can be used either as a, as a proper name, referring to the devil himself, or it can be used in the sense of a, a, an adjective, an adversary, or a pronoun, or whatever it is, to talking about an individual, or a group, or a movement, or something of that nature. But here's what's important about Job. Have you ever looked at the book of Genesis, all 50 chapters of it, the book of Genesis? Have you ever done a concordance search in Genesis for the word Satan? How many has ever done that? I mean, you never thought to do that. It's not in there. Isn't that remarkable? It's not in the book of Genesis. Are you, are you trying to say the devil started? No, I'm not saying the devil started here. The Bible said plainly, the serpent beguiled Eve. This is what the apostle said in the New Testament, talking about what happened in Genesis 3. But you know, when you look at this thing, you might begin to think, well, I wonder why the book of Genesis doesn't use the word Satan, which is a Hebrew word, folks. Hebrew. You know, it's not like Lucifer. You're pulling a Latin word into the text. It's Hebrew. But Genesis doesn't use, it doesn't use that term, and yet the devil is certainly in the book of Genesis. No question about that. None whatsoever. It could very well be for this reason. The fall of Satan is a progressive thing. As I've said to you before, when he was kicked out of heaven and kicked down to this earth, that was the beginning of his ultimate fall into the lake of fire and brimstone. And Satan himself will stand and be judged one day. What happened in the book of Genesis is when man, Adam, the first man, Adam, when, man, when the first man, Adam, literally abdicated the throne that God had given him because he gave him dominion over the earth. Being given dominion over the earth, Adam was the king of the earth in that sense because he was the king over the kingdom of heaven. But when he fell by saving his wife from death, and that's exactly what he did, when he fell by doing that, it cost him the throne. It cost him the crown. And the crown reverted back to the devil, Satan. It reverted back to the one who has the power of death. If you look at the book of Job, chapter number, one, chapter number uh, 2, you'll see. Look over here. Chapter number 2 of the book of Job. And verse number 6. The Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand. But do what? Save his life. Satan has the power of death, had the power of death. The book of Hebrews talks plainly about through their lifetime they feared him that had the power of death, that is the devil. They knew that Satan could kill them. 
that he had legal authority and right to do that. Now, when you come to the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 5, and you're talking about the man who had his father's wife, the Apostle Paul said, turn such an one over to Satan or to the devil for the destruction of the flesh. Satan could still kill. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 5, he had the power of death. The Bible said when the Lord Jesus Christ came to this world, he came to destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. How did he do it? He did it by winning back the crown to the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. He won back what Adam handed to the devil. He won it back. The ministry of Christ 2,000 years ago when God incarnated himself in flesh is to not belittle at all. He is the Redeemer and the Savior. Absolutely. But there's more going on than that. And so this uh, buying back or this earning back and this taking back from Satan <clears throat> the, and taking from him the authority of death. The Bible says now to resist the devil and he'll do what? And don't take that lightly. Don't take that lightly. Don't take that lightly. Because remember, you're talking about one that has the power of death. Now when you look at 1 Corinthians, I mean the book of Job, you'll find that when Job, when Job first encountered Satan, Satan was able to destroy his property, he was able to kill his children, he was able to call fire down from heaven, and he was able to bring a hurricane on, in on him. That's a lot of power. Satan can therefore inflict your body with disease. He can inflict your body with boils and sores. He can send a hurricane. He can call fire down from heaven. Revelation 13. When the Antichrist shows up, he'll have the power to call fire down from heaven. So a being that has that kind of power, you better respect him. It is an ignorant individual that makes fun of Satan as if that they can just swipe their hand and move him out of the way. Notice what he said to the Lord when the Lord said, where have you been? He said, I've been walking to and fro in the earth. If you dig a little deeper into that, you'll find out that the root meaning of that is, in haste, he had been moving from one to the other. He doesn't waste time. He has a motive. He's got a mission. And he doesn't waste time. Now what you get into with this is a concept of a spirit being. Satan is not a man like you and me. He's not a physical being like you and me. Satan is a spirit being who came into being <coughs> by the hand of Almighty God. But God did not create the devil. He created the anointed cherub, Ezekiel 28, that covereth. And that anointed cherub by his own volition chose to rebel against God. God's got a reason for there to be a devil. He has a reason for a Satan. Somebody said, why doesn't God just destroy him? Why doesn't he? He has a purpose in his existence. The Lord knows everything he intends to do. Don't ever pull God down to your human level and try to, try to rationalize in your mind What's going on in this spirit world and the battle that's raging for the souls of men? Satan operates on a much higher level than a human being does. And Satan is walking about seeking whom he may devour. He might have passed you yesterday and he couldn't devour you, but you may be ready today. You say, well, now how can he do this? You've got billions of people on the earth. Well, that gets into the issue of the essence of Satan. It gets into the issue of the essence of a spirit. Just like I've said to you before so many times, God is a spirit being. No one knows the essence of a spirit. The hypostasis there in Hebrews chapter number 1 is where Christ is the exact image or the, divide, the, the perfect image of the invisible person of God. When Christ showed up, He is the direct image of God the Father here on this earth, manifest as a man. But what does the image of God the Father look like? What is the essence of God the Father? You see what I mean? He's a spirit. The Lord Jesus says, God is a spirit to the woman at the well in John 4. 
God is the Spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Therefore, it seems to teach to me that unless you are born of the Spirit of the living God, all you're going to do is produce some words, but there's not going to be any worship. Worship comes from that one that has been born again. Because you have a spirit now that can worship God. And you can commune with Him. So Satan is a spirit being. How do you define him then, preacher? How do you, how do you, how do you understand Satan? What limitations does he have? How do you classify him? Well, I believe, and some folks don't agree with me, but I believe that Satan is one of the original five cherubim. Five of them. Four are left. You read about them in Revelation 4 and 5. There's four of them left. But one of them fell. He's the fifth cherub. A cherubim is a mysterious creature. It is a creature, though. Everything apart from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost is a creature. They've all been brought into existence by that eternal, almighty, absolute being. Either... As the case of man, breathe the breath of life into your nostrils. You became a living soul. And when you leave this world, your soul goes back to the one who gave it. That breath goes right back to God who gave it, who's the father of life. <laughs> but cherubim, nothing is said about breathing into a cherubim or to an angel or to a seraphim. Now think about this for a minute. The Old Testament talks about the life that is in a human being, in a man. And it says that that life that is in a man, now think what I'm saying, that the life that is in a man is no more substantial or no more secure than a simple breath that's in the nostrils. Have you ever noticed how easy it is for somebody to die? <laughs> the life of God is not the breath in his nostrils. The life of the Lord Jesus Christ when He was here 2,000 years ago was not the breath in His nostrils. He had to offer that life back to God the Father. He said, Father, into Thy hands I commend My Spirit. What's that mean? I'm giving You My life. He had power over it. It could not be taken from Him. The cross did not kill Him. The cross did not kill Him. He was not killed. He said, no man takes my life. I lay it down freely. That tells me that the life that was in the Lord Jesus Christ was a far more substantial life that's in, the, in, in any human being. For all of us today can die so quickly that it will blow your mind at how quickly we can leave this world. Have you ever heard of anybody dropping dead? And that's a reality. It can happen. Dead before you hit the floor. <laughs> That's probably about one of the best ways to go, if you don't know the truth. But if you've said all your goodbyes, and you're and surrounded with your loved ones, and you look at them and say, well, I'm gone. Bang. <laughs> See you later. Meet you by the river. That beats about six months or a year in intensive care, eat up with cancer, suffering every day, shot full of morphine. Uh, I can think of a lot of worse ways to leave this world than to just drop dead. Amen. Amen. As I've said to you before, the best place to be if they ever send a 50 megaton bomb down on this country and drop it over Tennessee is to be at ground zero. You don't want to live after something like that has been dropped on this nation. You don't want to be here. That would be the most horrendous time that humanity has ever faced in its existence. So we don't know the essence of Satan. We don't know the essence of Satan. We don't know the essence of Satan. We know he is a reality. But what I'm saying by that is how long does it take him to move from here to that wall? How long would it take Satan to go from here to England? How long would it take him to traverse the earth? You see what I'm saying? Now, don't misunderstand me. There is only one being that is omnipresent, and that's God. He can be anywhere and everywhere at the same time. That's God. That's omnipresence. But that's divine. That's, that's, that's limited to the Almighty. He's the only one who can do that. And, but everything else has to travel. But how does he travel? And what restrictions does he have? And how long does it take? Here's my point tonight. Let's say the devil's working you over real good right now. All right? 
He's got you where He wants you. I mean, He's working you over real good. Well, what about all these others? What have we got out here now? Seven, eight, nine billion people on this planet? Seven thousand million people? That's a bunch of people, right? Well, what about the fellow over there in England says he's working him over good, too? At the same time, he's working you over. You say, well, he can't be working both of us at the same time. <coughs> I don't know how far to go with that. But I'm going to tell you this. Your adversary of the devil is a roaring lion. Walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And the Bible said, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. I don't want to mess with Satan. I'll do exactly with him as Michael did over the body of Moses. The Lord rebuke thee, Satan. And leave it at that. I'll make, the, I'll make the confrontation not between me and Satan. And I hope you never get to that arrogant point where you think you can confront Satan. The confrontation will not be between me and Satan. The confrontation will be between Satan and my Lord. And I'll let him be the advocate and I'll let him take care of it. So over here in the book of Job, this is the first mention of Satan in the Bible. Now, I know if you do a concordance search, you'll find that he shows up in 1 Chronicles, I think it is, before here. But 1 Chronicles, chronologically, is much later than what you're reading about in Job. So chronologically, in other words, in the span of time, from the beginning of creation till this point, this is the first mention of the word Satan in the Bible. That ought to be interesting. It ought to be interesting. Because a lot of people, for some reason or another, today, refuse to believe that the devil can inflict stuff on you and that the devil can cause you all kinds of trouble. And folks, believe me, he can. He's looking for someone who is naive and immature enough to believe that they can take Satan on. Now look over here in Matthew chapter number 4. As far as I know, this is the best illustration you'll ever find of a confrontation between Satan and Christ. I say that because there might have been some confrontations that aren't recorded in the Bible. In Matthew chapter number 4, verse 1, was Jesus led of the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted of the diablos, the devil. That's a generic term. That's a malevolent being. Okay? That's what it means, a malevolent being. When he fasted 40 days, 40 nights, he was afterward unhungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. Now here's what's important about what's going on here. He answered and said, It is written. It is written. Look at verse 7. But Jesus said unto him, It is written. Look at verse 10. Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written. Every time Satan came against Christ to assault him, the Lord Jesus Christ did not appeal to his own authority over Satan, which he had. But had he done that, then he would have no longer been trusting completely in the power of the Holy Spirit of God and the written Word of God. It's not that it would have been a sin, but it's just that Satan could have stood up there before God and said, you see, you broke the rules. It was in weakness that Christ died on the cross. What's that mean? It means that as a man, the man Christ Jesus, it was the blood of that man that redeems you from your sins. The blood of that man is the blood of God. But he bled just like you bleed. And he hurt just like you hurt. And therefore, as a man, folks, as a man, just like when the first man lost it, the second man, that's what Christ is called, the second man got it back. So as a man, he defeated Satan, not as God, and not as the second person of the Trinity, but as a man. Notice carefully, it is written everywhere in the New Testament that the Lord Jesus Christ appeals to the Bible. He never one time, not one single time, causes doubt to be cast on the Word of God. He appeals to it in the sense that, thus saith the Lord... 
You can believe the Bible. When he talked about uh, Jonah, he said as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish. Messed up, didn't I? How many of you got that? What did he say? He said whale, didn't he? I'm not going to change it. I'm going to leave it the way it is. If that's what it says, that's what it says. Right? He talked about Daniel the prophet. Graf Weldhausen, school of higher criticism over there in Germany back in the 1800s. They came along and said, Daniel is a, it was written probably 300 B.C. Long after the event, there was no real Daniel the prophet. Israel, a little tribal, little tri a tribe out here with a tribal God. They created all of this, never existed. He never, and David, the king of Israel, never lived. They never had a king, all of this stuff. And they cast doubt on the word of God. And a lot of young men go off to Bible colleges, come back infidels, because of what, what they get when they, when they get in there. The Lord Jesus Christ didn't do that. He called Daniel a prophet, and he said Jonah was in the belly of a whale. And, of course, he used that as a type of him being three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. In other words, my point is this. You can have absolute, complete trust in the Word of God to be your weapon against Satan. That's how you're going to deal with him. You are going to quote Scripture when Satan comes after you. You're going to quote the Bible. If Satan comes to you and says, look how your life is going. You're trying to serve the Lord, and look what it's done for you. It's just not paying off, is it? Then you quote him, Acts, Romans chapter number 8. Well, Satan, all things work together for good, for those that love God, for those who are the called according to his purpose. You quote the Bible to the devil, and listen, folks. The pagan out here on the street doesn't have a clue what a Bible is, but the devil does. Demons do. The devil and demons know what the blood's about. If a Christian knows the power of the blood of Christ, you believe, believe me, you can quote that power against Satan, against demonic forces. Liberalism, so-called Christian liberalism, has gutted the power out of the church, taken it from the Word of God. And now it's nothing in the world more than a mouth, mouthpiece for political correctness and progressive Progressive liberalism. That's all it is. Just a bunch of garbage. I wouldn't, I wouldn't clean my shoes on a place like that. Amen, folks. That's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a highway to hell. Especially to walk into a place like that with crosses all over the place and you don't hear any gospel. There's no, they, they cause you to deny. They deny the Bible. They destroy your faith in Christ. That's no good. That's garbage. The Lord Jesus quoted the Scripture. He believed the Scripture. To the two on the road to Emmaus, after his resurrection, he said, O fools and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ first to have suffered, then enter into his glory? That breaks the Bible down into two distinct periods in the ministry of Christ. The suffering Savior and the reigning Savior. And they said, Did not our hearts burn within us when he opened to us the Scripture? How are you going to open the Scripture to somebody if you don't believe it? If the Lord Jesus Christ did not believe the Bible, why would he bother to even open it? You see what I mean? He believed the Bible. He said not one jot nor one tittle. Not anything about this book. He said, you say you are children of Abraham. Well, he said, Abraham saw my day. You say that you follow the law of Moses. Well, if you read what Moses said, Moses spoke of me. Referring back to the story of Abraham, giving it validity, and back to Moses, saying that what Moses said was of God. The Scripture, therefore, becomes your foundation for whether or not you have any joy, any happiness, any victory, or anything in your Christian life that gets you through. There's going to be a promise in the Word of God for every situation that you go through in life. God's got a promise for it. He's got a promise. The Word of God will be your life. It will sustain your life. The Word of God is life-giving. It's life-giving. It's a living book. The Word of God is quick. Quick means alive. It's a living book. But you need to know the Bible. So when you're, being, when you, when you're coming under the onslaught of demons and Satan, then you can say in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of Christ, in the name of Christ, I plead the blood covenant against you, Satan. 
You have to deal with the blood of Christ and not me anymore. Don't appeal to me. You can't come back to the devil and say, Well, you know, Satan, I've straightened up an awful lot since I got saved, and I've got a lot of stuff squared away. I know I've got a problem here and there, but, uh, but after all, you know, I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> oh, he'll sift you like wheat. What do you do then, preacher? You come back to Satan and say, The Lord Jesus Christ is my righteousness. I'm not perfect, Satan, but Christ is my righteousness. He is made into me righteousness. He is the one that I appeal to. It is what He earned at Calvary. It is who He is now at the right hand of the Father that will justify me and carry me into His presence one day. It's all about Him, Satan, and not me. Satan, you can pick me to death. I agree with you. No question about it. i got all kinds of problems, but I've got an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. And that's what John said in 1 John. I have an advocate. I have a lawyer. <laughs> that's literally what it means. I've got someone that's going to plead my case and carry me before the Father. Not only do that, Romans 8 says, we know not what we should pray for as we ought. So the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Not only do I have the Lord Jesus Christ as my advocate with the Father, I've got the Holy Ghost praying for me. <laughs> Amen. That's pretty good. I'm pretty good shape tonight. <laughs> Amen. Amen. If you ever get to the place to where you feel like you've arrived, and they've hung enough awards on your chest, and you've been bragged on to high heaven, and you feel just a little bit better than most of the Christians around you, what I'm telling you is happening to you is you're full of pride, you're pumped up with yourself, you become a narcissist, and you think you can approach God with that? The Bible said, God resisteth the proud. Giveth grace to the humble. Don't ever get to the point where you get past the old sinner that smote his chest. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. As I said to you before, I think it bears repeating. Do you think that's the only time he ever did that? No. Don't believe that for a minute. No. No. Pharisee would stand on the street corner with all of his robes and he'd pray long scripted, memorized prayer. Beautiful, oh boy. <laughs> Have you ever prayed a beautiful prayer? How many of you ever prayed a beautiful prayer? I've prayed some of the prettiest prayers you ever heard. Now raise your hand. Everybody's prayed them. You've heard somebody pray one, you thought, boy, that sounds good. I'm going to try that. And you get down in the aisle, you get in closing the book, close the door, get off in the hole somewhere. Now, Lord, we thank you for this day, and we thank you that you're almighty, and oh, we just praise God for your righteousness. And you get into a big, long thing, and boy, you say to yourself while you're praying it, man, that sounds good. Did you know that that's what he said about the Pharisee? He prayed thus with himself. <laughs> no, just be, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And he will. He will. He will. Well, preacher, I've got the devil figured out. Oh, do you really? Oh, yeah, I've got him figured out. I know his tactics. I know what to expect from him. Do you really? Do you think he might be able to change his tactics? Do you think he might be able to come at you with something new? Yeah. That word over there, we're not, we're not ignorant of his tactics or his devices, is the Greek word logistics. That's where we get logistics. Logistics has to do with you take a commander in the field with an army, and uh, he, has, he has officers that are appointed over nothing in the world more than logistics. They have to see to it that all of the motorcade is right. They've got, they've, got the, they've got the fuel. They've got the weapons. They've got the ammunition. They've got everything right. They've got it set up. And they've got the battle plan laid out. They know where they're going to strike, when they're going to strike, what force is going to be, what general is going to command this and this and this. And that's logistics. We're not ignorant of his logistics. We always remember that he is our sworn enemy. He's the enemy of our soul. And the only one that has over, ever overcome him. David failed, Solomon failed, they all failed, Abraham failed, Daniel failed, they all failed. But there's one who did not fall, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Plead his case. Father, I pray you bless your word tonight, and bless my brothers and my sisters. In Jesus' name.